What I'd like to do now is talk about the idea of a matrix invariant. Let's imagine that we have some matrix A, and maybe it represents some interesting physical quantity. Let's imagine, for example, that it represents the state of strain in some object. You take a piece of rubber or plastic and you twist it, and that puts some forces inside the material that at some point might be represented by a matrix A. Now there's some energy embedded in that, and that energy is a scalar number. And so what we might like to be able to do is to write down some function that takes that matrix A and produces that scalar number. Now you could think of a lot of different ways to do that, but one thing that's a little bit funny is that somehow the physical quantity, say the energy in this case, shouldn't depend on the coordinate system that I happen to choose, right? If I was to rotate the object like this, it doesn't change the amount of, say, strain that I'm applying to the object. That is to say that we'd like this quantity to be invariant to the basis we choose. So if I decide that X, Y, and Z are some different direction, that shouldn't change these physical quantities. Similarly, if I started out thinking about the dimensions in centimeters and I changed one of them to meters, say, that shouldn't change the physical quantities that I compute about this matrix. So when we talk about properties that don't change when we change the basis, then we talk about those as being basis invariant. And these are very, very important quantities for a lot of different things, uh, not just in various kinds of physical problems, but also in the way people analyze, say, social networks in this area of what's called spectral graph theory, important in various kinds of machine learning algorithms and many other things. Now for arbitrary matrices, there are actually turned out to be a lot of different kinds of what we would call matrix invariants but there are two that we always have that are extremely important, and those are the trace and the determinant. These are two quantities that we can reason about and that inform a lot of other kinds of linear algebraic computation that are both basis invariant. So let's talk about trace to start off. Fundamentally, the trace is just the sum of the diagonal elements of a square matrix. When we talk about the trace of a matrix A, we often write this as like TR of the matrix A. And since it's just a sum, it has some nice linearity properties. So for example, it has the property that if I have some scale attached to the matrix A, and I ask what's the trace of that scaled matrix, it's just the scale of the trace. Similarly, if I wanna know what the trace is of a matrix A plus a matrix B, then that's going to be the sum of the traces. Another important thing is that trace exhibits a certain kind of commutativity of its arguments. That is to say that the trace of A multiplied by B, again, assu assuming I should say that A and B are dimensionally compatible, is equal to the trace of B multiplied by A. Note, in particular, that this is not equal to trace A multiplied by trace B. Now, this rule about commutativity is really important, so let's just take a minute to convince ourselves that this is true. So let's write out as a summation the trace of A multiplied by B, just to take a look. This is a sum over the diagonal elements, I, of let's say the matrix A B, I, I. So that's just all of the places where the row equals the column. The entry I, I in A times B is itself a sum. So let's write that, that out as well. And what we would see is that we would have this inner dimension J and we would have I, J multiplied by B, J, I. So we can see that we could swap these around and it wouldn't change the trace. Let's think about the implications of that then. So let's imagine that I had trace A, B, and C, and that these again are all dimensionally compatible. Then I could use the associativity of matrix multiplication to swap this around. So I could say, let's treat this as trace of a, B multiplied by C. Then, because of this commutativity, I could have written that as trace of C 
multiply by A, multiply by B. So this is what we refer to sometimes as the cyclic property of trace, which is that as long as the ordering is preserved and the dimensions are compatible, we can take the front and move it to the back and that preserves the value of the trace. Note that this does not necessarily allow for arbitrary permutations, only cyclic permutations. That is to say that it's not necessarily the case that this will be equal to a, C, B. The reason is this commutativity effect requires us to apply it to the entire matrix inside the trace. We can't selectively apply it just to like the B and the C. So now we can start to see some interesting properties of traces and why we refer to the trace as a matrix invariant. So the thing we just convinced ourselves of was this idea that if I have the trace of A multiplied by B multiplied by C, and again, assuming that they're dimensionally consistent, then I could pull the C around and do this and have C, A, B, and I could pull the B around and get trace B, C, A as well. So this is a pretty interesting property. Uh, this comes up quite a lot, but one of the effects of this is it reveals to us what we mean by a matrix invariant. And so let's imagine that we have some A and we care about its trace. And someone comes along and hits A on either side with an invertible matrix M and its inverse. And so someone comes along and says M multiplied by A multiplied by M inverse. This is like a change of basis, right? So somebody changes the coordinate system in which your linear transformation A is operating. So you have a square matrix A, you hit it with square invertible matrices M and M's inverse on either side. So this is just like changing the units or maybe rotating or doing some kind of transformation, but one that sort of preserves the structure. So now if I ask what's the trace of that, is it different? And the answer is no, because of course what I can do is I can rotate M around like that. And now this is the identity. And so that means that this is equal to just trace of A. We can see that the trace is invariant to a change of basis. Now the other matrix invariant for squared matrices that you wanna build some intuition and understanding for over time is the idea of the determinant. So if you think of the trace as being sums of things, the determinant is the product of things. And in this case, the things are the eigenvalues of the matrix, which we'll talk about in a couple of lectures. But whereas the trace is kind of easy to think about how to compute and, uh, and how to reason about, the determinant's a little bit more complicated. However, the determinant has very important geometric interpretations about the volumes of the higher dimensional polytopes that you would get. Now that sounds like kind of an obscure thing to want, but it turns out to be very important for constructing various kinds of random objects. For example, the determinant is how you compute the normalization constant for the multivariate Gaussian distribution, which we use absolutely all over the place in machine learning. And then there are also very fancy random objects that get some play in modern machine learning called determinantal point processes, where the determinant gives you a way to actually talk about the diversity of a set of random objects, such as you might get, say, in a set of search results from Google. These geometric intuitions admittedly are a little bit hard to come by, but we still need to be aware of the determinant and some of its properties. So the first major property to be aware of is that the determinant of the identity matrix is one. And incidentally here, I'm going to write debt for determinant, but sometimes also people write what looks like the absolute value symbol around the matrix to indicate determinant. Another thing to be aware of is that the determinant is preserved by transpose. So the determinant of A transpose is just the determinant of A. Also, unlike the trace, if I take the determinant of the product of two matrices, then this is going to be equal to the, determin the product of the determinants. If I have an invertible matrix A, the determinant of the inverse of A 
is equal to the reciprocal of the determinant of A. This is really important because it reveals something that we need to know, which is that singular matrices, that is matrices that do not have an inverse, have a determinant of zero. Note also that whereas product behaves nicely with determinant and doesn't with trace, in general, the determinant of the sum of two matrices is not going to be the sum of the determinants. So debt A plus B is not in general equal to the sum of the determinants. Another thing to realize is that if I have some scalar, say C, that I multiply by the square matrix alpha, that this actually gets kind of amplified. That is that we would have C to the N multiplied by the determinant of A. Where N is the uh, size of the matrix. So this is saying that A is N by N. So with these properties, in particular with the combination of these two properties, we can see why the determinant is also an invariant. So let's imagine as before that I have some invertible matrix M and I'm in the situation where I take, I want to know the determinant of M A M inverse. So think of this like a change of basis, some invertible matrix M. Then what happens is I can chop this up I can get determinant of M, determinant of A, and of course, determinant of M inverse. And so now if we look at this property, we can see that this is going to be one over this. And so we wind up with this just being debt A. So hitting it on either side with M and M inverse doesn't change the value of the determinant. So it is also a matrix inverse in the way that we've been talking about it. That is a change of basis does not change the value of the determinant.